You're at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. I'm your host, John Cook. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at Houston Methodist. And joining me in the studio today is Dr. Lee Lai, uh, one of our faculty members in the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences. And uh, she's going to be introducing our guest, Dr. Naomi Hamburg. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today is my great, great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Hamburger Naomi. Um, Dr. Hamburger is a Joseph A. Vita Professor of Medicine, Chief of the Vascular Biology Section, and Interim Director of the Whisker Cardiovascular Institute at Boston University School of Medicine. She received her bachelor's and medical degree from Harvard University and complete uh, the internship and residency in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. She completed her Master of Science in Epidemiology at Boston University School of Public Health. Then she joined Boston University School of Medicine as faculty since 2007. Um, Dr. Hamburger is a recognized expert in the field of vascular medicine and the clinical translation of vascular biology. Her research work seeks to understand approaches to restore vascular health in patients with cardiometabolic disorders, peripheral artery disease, and to uh, evaluate the impact of novel tobacco products and long COVID. She has developed highly innovative approaches to study endothelial cell from patient to dissect the mechanisms of disease and identify new targets for therapeutics to protect blood vessel. Uh, those work has been continuously funded by NIH. Dr. Hamburger has held multiple leadership positions in the field of vascular medicine, including um, as the chair of the Peripheral Vascular Disease Council of American Heart Association and as a member of uh, the Board of Society of Vascular Medicine, among others. Dr. Hamburger has authored more than 150 uh, scientific paper in peer-reviewed li literature and has served on guideline writing uh, committees. She is a past associate editor of Journal Vas uh, Vascular Medicine and the current associate editor of Circulation Research. So without further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Hamburger. Thank you, Dr. Hamburg, for joining us on the show. Thank you so much for having me today. A pleasure to be visiting you remotely. Um, Dr. Hamburg, you've uh, made tremendous contributions to the field of vascular medicine, and um, I wonder if you'd like to uh, tell us a little bit about your own practice as a vascular medicine doctor. You are, you've, you've been in a leadership position in Vascular Medicine Society and the American Heart Association. You've been, uh, you're, you're a clinician, but you're also a scientist. We're going to hear about that today. but. What is your life like? Uh, how, how much do you spend uh, in the clinic? How much time do you spend doing your science, leadership, that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll start with a little bit about how I got here and then I'll talk about where I am today. So, um, so I started in this uh, practice to become vascular medicine. Actually, when I was a medical student, I got uh, really interested in the intersection of women's health and cardiovascular disease. And I, I joined the research group at the Brigham that was led by Peter Gans, Mark Krieger, and Marie Gerhardt at the time. Um, and that's how I was introduced into the world of vascular medicine and, and endothelial biology and endothelial health that I've really continued for my entire career. Um, what it looks like uh, for me today, so in my, uh, I run my own research group, which um, includes both PhD scientists, um, clinical fellows, postdocs, um, undergraduates, medical students, and um, we have um, a really special laboratory where we are able to study people and then collect cells that I'll talk to you about today, um, all in, in the same space. And then I also am fortunate to be able to be involved in overseeing uh, a research community in the Cardiovascular Institute and Vascular Biology that includes both physician scientists and, um, and PhD scientists. And then my clinical work, I do, I see outpatients um, with vascular diseases and I've stayed pretty broadly um, in both venous and arterial vascular diseases and I've taken on I'm not going to talk much about today, but I've also taken on seeing patients with um, 
with long COVID as part of my outpatient practice. And, and then I read vascular studies and I oversee our vascular medicine fellowship. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I have a little bit of general cardiology. Wonderful. <laughs> but, uh, and as, you, as you mentioned, you, if there's three major areas of research for your group. I guess we'll be, uh, th those are diabetes and uh, nicotine and, and uh, COVID. Um, I, I, yeah. We probably won't be talking about the COVID today, but um, do you think that uh, the COVID, uh, there's an endotheliopathy that contributes to the disease? Yeah, that's what we've been really interested in. As you know, early on in the pandemic, we talked a lot about um, this concept of there being an endotheliopathy and people with, especially people with severe disease and saw this evidence of microthrombosis and some, you know, have been involved in some of the clinical trials where I think really the evidence has been pretty mixed about the value of anticoagulation um, in patients, certainly in inpatients with COVID. And as we're now moving, we don't have any evidence for whether that's gonna be beneficial um, in long COVID patients. And, but what I also am interested in is what is happening in these patients who have had COVID, didn't necessarily have severe COVID, but have persistent symptoms. And it still remains a mystery, but we're starting to get little bits of evidence about whether there's uh, potentially mitochondrial dysfunction and persistent inflammation. And while we may be seeing those say in muscle, I still think that it's really interesting to think about whether it's also happening at the endothelial cell level, whether this is kind of an accelerated aging phenomenon that we're seeing in some patients who have ongoing chronic inflammation and symptoms from COVID. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and the other area that uh, we may not have time to get to today is the uh, work that you've been doing with uh, nicotine. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'll share a little bit about that. Uh, we've been interested in, you know, we know from decades now about the harmful effects of tobacco. And in some ways, I think in the scientific community, we've kind of put it aside. We know that. But what's really interesting in the cardiovascular space is that we don't fully know what it is in tobacco. You're talking about nicotine. Is it nicotine? What are the components in, uh, in tobacco products that drive the increased vascular injury and risk. And that's now led to this new conundrum, which as we have new tobacco products like electronic cigarettes, um, orally delivered nicotine products, and the rapid evolution that we've seen in, um, in the vaping products, are they actually less harmful? And some of the cancer community kind of has identified tar as driving cancer, but what is it? that's driving cardiovascular risk. And so we've been interested in thinking about how we might assess um, the early vascular injury from some of these products to really understand, are they truly reduced risk? And then there's the complexities of thinking about, are they reduced risk for people who are already using tobacco products who are trying to transition off of them? Or are, and what about all of the young people who are taking up novel tobacco products without the same set of stigma that we've put on to traditional tobacco products. Mm -hmm. I was uh, ha happened to be at some of those early meetings between the FDA and the tobacco companies and the CDC about uh, reduced harm products, and uh, which ultimately led to the e-cigarettes. And uh, we, we presented our work showing that nicotine actually is uh, not that benign. It's actually, uh, endothelial cells have nicotinic receptors that uh, when stimulated, enhance endothelial cell proliferation and angiogenesis. We showed that tumor angiogenesis and uh, plaque neovascularization and retinal neovascularization could be accelerated by, by nicotine and maybe uh, you know, participating in, in those disease processes. And the other thing we learned is that chronic exposure to nicotine could downregulate angiogenesis. And, you know, that could, uh, for chronic smokers, uh, we know that those patients are much more prone to getting um, peripheral arterial disease and critical limb ischemia. And, you know, perhaps, do you think that there may be some direct effect on the microvasculature of nicotine and or tobacco that puts people at risk? Yeah, well, we certainly know, for example, in the vascular world that um, that nicotine seems to be the driver of Berger's disease, which is a, you know, small vessel disease um, that can lead to amputations. Um, and I do think that it's important to think about nicotine as a driver in the cardiovascular space, both in terms of the acute effects, um, as well as, as you're suggesting, the chronic effects. And a lot of these uh, novel 
tobacco products like electronic cigarettes and with synthetic nicotine actually probably have higher delivery of, uh, of nicotine than, um, than some cigarette products. And so we're really not avoiding either the addiction that you see with nicotine and potentially some of the long-term cardiovascular effects, which we're seeing, or I should say sort of more acute cardiovascular effects and changes that persist um, at the endothelial level with these new products. Well, we should probably go ahead and, and let you show your slides and uh, tell us what you came here to say today. Yeah, great conversation. Happy to continue it. So let me uh, share my, my slides with you. Looks good. I hope looks good. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk to you today about our work um, looking at endothelial health. And as I put in my title, as a window to the heart, but as a vascular specialist, I'm also going to talk to you about uh, uh, the legs and vascular disease in the legs. So many of you are cardiovascular scientists, and I think about, you know, we talked a little bit about my personal journey and how I got to what I'm doing today, but I also think about uh, the scientific we wor work we do as a translational vascular journey. This is from a cover of a compendium that Nick Leeper is at Stanford, and I, um, that I met, um, as Don knows, when we were both K-12 fellows training in vascular medicine, he at Stanford and, and me at BU. So, um, uh, we uh, had this kind of concept that we want to keep our patients in this in this healthier state, like the patient in the front, and avoid uh, the, the ending up with pain or amputation. And all of the science that's behind that, from genetics to animal models to uh, studying uh, samples from patients. Uh, so this is a research conference, but I, as a, a physician scientist, I like to start with the case. So. A 65-year-old woman who has type 2 diabetes, has had a prior coronary intervention, is a smoker, uh, and describes leg fatigue with walking and has a reduced ankle brachial index of 0.7, indicating the presence of peripheral artery disease, or PAD. And over the course of the talk today, I'm going to talk about what are, start with some of the clinical uh, evidence linking type 2 diabetes and PAD then talking about endothelial dysfunction and how it might be relevant to PED, and then spend a bulk of time talking about some of our work looking at mechanisms of endothelial dysfunction in patients with diabetes. A little bit uh, to continue our conversation about novel tobacco products and endothelial health, and, and finish uh, with just some updates about therapies for a P, the com combination of PED and diabetes. Um, so PED is, is in large part a disease of aging. This is a, a graph from um, data from the ERIC study, Kuni Mashishito. So you can see that with older age, there's a rise in the cumulative incidence of having peripheral artery disease. It's estimated that over 200 million people worldwide have PED. Um, in this country, as you can see here, we know that it happens at an earlier age and at a higher rate in black men and women. And importantly, it's uh, I, I continue to talk about PAD partly because um, our communities and our patients don't know about PAD. So even those people who have risk factors and walking impairment don't are not aware of that PAD exists. There's a lot of different lines of evidence that patients who have diabetes have heightened risk in PAD. And we can talk more about, you know, whether their uh, their disease is the same or or that there's uh, distinct features of atherosclerosis in patients with diabetes. I'm showing a couple of uh, lines of clinical evidence here. One about amputations. So overall, in this country, over time, we're having a reduction in the rate of overall amputations, but that's not true amongst patients with diabetes who are shown in the top panel. Whether it's all amputations or major amputations, they're actually rising amongst patients with PAD. And then on the right, uh, that's data from the uh, from the Voyager trial, which is an antithrombotic strategies in patients after revascularization with PED. And you can look and see that those patients who have diabetes um, in that study, regardless of their treatment arm, had a higher rate of combined cardiovascular and limb outcomes, really identifying this as a particularly high-risk group. 
And we talked a little bit about this concept, I think, um, in the clinical realm and then perhaps in the research realm as well, we've tended to put ourselves into these silos that diabetes is about glucose and monitoring glucose and the treatments are about lowering glucose, whereas uh, PED, for example, or even coronary disease as well, or atherosclerosis disease, and um, we're thinking about atherosclerosis therapies. But I really like to uh, posit that diabetes really is an, a, an atherosclerotic disease and that what patients with diabetes end up uh, suffering from the most and, um, and leading to both morbidity and mortality is the concomitant atherosclerotic disease. And so when we think sort of on the right about drivers of PAD, so I'm talking about particular risk factors that are drivers of PAD, and I'll talk about diabetes, um, and also about a little bit about smoking and tobacco. Uh, and then when we get to these inner circles, right, we have both a microvascular and macrovascular disease um, and, the, and organ. And then on, I just like to think about also in patients with PED and why is it important to think about endothelial function? Well, what's interesting is that while this is a disease of, of uh, development of progressive athero um, and superimposed thrombosis in the limb, the, the degree of atherosclerosis and obstruction isn't a great marker for the clinical expression of disease. So whether that's measured by ankle brachial index or by by imaging, the degree of uh, the burden of disease doesn't necessarily predict the individual symptoms, how far they can walk before they have pain, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, and whether they go on to develop um, ulcers and critical limb-threatening ischemia. And so there are clearly other factors that are important for driving disease, including um, abnormalities um, in endothelial function, inflammation, oxidative stress, and abnormalities at the muscle level. And we've really focused on thinking about what's happening in the endothelial cells. Um, and you know, this is a sort of simplified version of what I learned from uh, my mentor, Joe Vita, thinking about the endothelial health as a barometer of cardiovascular risk. So the concept here is that we know that there are many new and emerging risk factors for, uh, for atherosclerotic vascular disease and that the endothelial cell is exposed to injury from these risk factors, kind of has a cumulative um, uh, damage or injury from these risk factors, and that ultimately that predisposes to cardiovascular events. So it's an early event, and that if we understood what was happening uh, with endothelial function and endothelial biology, not only would we potentially be able to direct our therapies, but re restore or reverse the vascular damage. And so um, when I sort of started doing all this work, we were thinking a lot about uh, measuring endothelial function in people in terms of measuring vascular reactivity or arterial stiffness. And so I've done uh, work um, both in the laboratory as well as in the Framingham Heart Study looking at measures of vascular health, looking at measures of flow mediated dilation, which is a measure of nitric oxide dependent uh, vasodilation, in a conduit uh, vessel in the brachial artery, uh, measuring that in the fingertip, um, using uh, a cuff-based measure in the, in the finger, and then looking at stiffness. And when you look, say, uh, just start here in patients with PAD, cross-sectionally, we looked at uh, their flow-mediated dilation response in a cohort of patients we had studied in the laboratory. And you can see that those with peripheral artery disease have lower flow-mediated dilation response uh, than the controls, and interestingly, lower than patients with coronary disease. And the patients with combined, so now we're calling these patients polyvascular disease, CED plus PED, have the lowest uh, flow media dilation response. And when we look prospectively at events, we've shown that both um, the conduit vessel response, the flow media dilation, as well as uh, reactive hyperemia, which is a um, measure of microvascular function, are related to predicting events in the Framingham Heart Study. And then this digital vascular response, interestingly, in the Framingham Heart Study was most predictive of stroke events. So I think sort of talking about this, uh, we have a systemic uh, problem in, in endothelial health, and that relates to a set of adverse um, cardiovascular events, both in the limb uh, and in the brain and in the heart. But then we've been really then trying to move. So we understand that we can measure 
of vascular health using non-invasive approaches in large groups of people, but that what but the prob challenge is then what's actually happening at the endocell cell level, and it's hard to get a vascular tissue from patients. And so um, we've been using this methodology to collect endothelial cells um, now for more than 10 years, um, and largely doing this from venous endothelial cells. So the work I'm going to show you is largely from venous endothelial cells and how to talk about this sort of question about venous versus arterial endothelial cells. But we place a, an IV, and then we place a J-wire, which makes some contact with the endothelial surface, and some, and we collect those endothelial cells into a buffer. And then <clears throat> we can study them using immunofluorescence, and then I'll show you some transcriptomic uh, work as well to look at um, protein expression and signaling in these endothelial cells. And really, what's um, to me most interesting about these endothelial cells is that they're reflecting the phenotype from the patient um, acutely. So they're not, we're not culturing these endothelial cells, we're taking them and we're, we're studying them acutely after we, we take them from, from the person. Um, so our, some of our initial work was looking at patients with diabetes and what happens with insulin signaling, we know that uh, insulin is important in terms of activation of uh, nitric oxide in, in animal models um, and that the um, endothelial insulin response um, in these experimental models is important for um, atherogenesis, but what about in people? So we were able to take endothelial cells from people with and without diabetes and look at their response to insulin. So um, we looked at the insulin-mediated phosphorylation of ENOS at the activating site, and you can see that it's markedly reduced in people with diabetes compared to controls without diabetes. And similarly, individuals without diabetes, when we treat with insulin, there's an increase in uh, nitric oxide production that we don't see in patients with diabetes. And that this response that we see in the endothelial cells associates with their flow-mediated dilation response, at least providing some correlative evidence that there's um, a link between what we see in these venous endothelial cells and their vasomotor response. Um, I, we've also looked at what happens, so I get asked a lot about this question of culturing these endothelial cells, but what's really interesting to me is what happens when you take the endothelial cells from people with diabetes and keep them even for 24 hours. So in this panel here, we looked at whether or not uh, if you keep them in normal glucose um, or put them in high glucose even for 24 hours, and you can see that when you put them in normal glucose for even for a short period of time, we see some restoration of this insulin response. Um, and this, the other set of panels here, we're looking at ogliknac, which is a, a glucose uh, modification that happens in many proteins. And we showed that this was higher in people with diabetes associated, not surprisingly, with their degree of glucose, uh, their ab with the, the level of abnormal glucose control, whether you measured this by their fasting glucose level or their hemoglobin A1C. And then uh, we could uh, use um, an agent to uh, modulate this uh, uh, GlickNAC modification to, to modulate what's happening when we keep them in normal glucose. Um, the response was, could, was uh, uh, not normalized if you kept them with this agent that preserved the GlickNAC response. So one mechanism whereby uh, glucose may be important in terms of protein modifications, but I think also interesting to me how quickly this reversed. Um, sort of to me, that's a, a positive sign. There's there's changes that can be made. There's the, the possibility of restoring the endothelial response um, in patients with diabetes. Um, you, you know, me, part of what we do also is mentoring, and so I just um, like to include this in my in my talk. I've been. Uh, having through um, our AHA Shore funding and uh, an AHA funded um, SFRN and cardiometabolic disease, we have a partnership with Tougaloo College where I've had now this summer, I'll have my fourth uh, student spending the summer with me from, from Tougaloo College. Um, a couple summers ago, Natalie Hampton was my, uh, was my mentee in this program and she looked at our data uh, by sex and by race in terms of what's happening in the endothelial cells and showed that the impairment that we see in the insulin response in patients with diabetes was true whether we looked at men or women or in um, black and white adults. I have a question, Dr. Hamburg, about yeah. the um, 
You, you showed mm -hmm. us that um, it, it, when you remove the endothelial cells from the patient, and, and from the diabetic patient, uh, and put them into a milieu in culture where they're exposed to normal glucose levels, that uh, insulin signaling is restored. And um, I thought that was interesting. I, I would have thought, though, that uh, some other functions would, might still be impaired because uh, my understanding is that chronic exposure to elevated levels of glucose and, and the other metabolic abnormalities that occur in, in patients with diabetes can have epigenetic effects that might be longer lasting. So d did you look at other uh, signaling pathways, other processes, endothelial processes in, in those cells that you got from the diabetic patients? Yeah, I think that's a, a critical point, and I and I'm sure that's correct. Um, we, you know, we've mostly been focused on looking at what happens when we take them out immediately. I think it would be really interesting to be able to look at what are their epigenetic markers that stay the same. Um, in you know, even if you take them into normal glucose, you're talking about this panel here, which that has to be the case, right? Some, it makes sort of sense to me that some signaling responses would be improved quickly, but that some other um, elements are going to persist. And, um, and, and you know, there's clearly gonna be cellular damage that isn't reversed quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, haven't looked at uh, a lot of other markers, but you can see here, right, that if we just, this is one possibility that if we leave, if we sort of keep the glucose modification response there, we then you don't have the restoration of the enos phosphorylation. So clearly there are some processes that are go going to persist. And I think there's a lot left to explore about what changes and what doesn't change. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, we've, I'm going to show you little part elements of different sets of stories that we've looked at to try to answer this question of, so we see this abnormal insulin response. Um, I connected it to, to some degree to, to glucose levels um, in the, in the, that the endothelial cells are exposed to, but then we've been looking a lot at other measures of, of organelle stress. So the concept being that you have these high uh, energy levels, you have high lipid levels, you have high glucose levels in patients with diabetes, then it overwhelms some of the organelle responses, including in the mitochondria, ER, and, um, and with autophagy. So um, the mitochondria are important in the endothelial cells. Um, less so for their energy production, but often in terms of their uh, regulation of oxidative stress. And so, uh, and one way that can happen is that these mit mitochondria undergo a life cycle, a fusion and fission. And perhaps as you're getting smaller fragmented mitochondria that may reflect uh, increased damage and increased oxidative stress. So we were able to show in the endothelial cells from patients with diabetes that we saw more fragmentation of the mitochondria, and that there's, at least by measurements um, using fluorescent dyes, that there's increased uh, mitochondrial oxidative stress in these, um, in these endothelial cells measured by, by mitosox. Uh, and then Jessica Fetterman did a set of work looking at autophagy. So autophagy is a process that clears not only damaged uh, mitochondrial elements, but other damaged proteins and organelles from, from cells. Um, and she looked at, uh, mitochond at autophagy in these endothelial cells that we collected from people with uh, diabetes and showed that there were higher levels of P62 expression, which is a protein that's cleared out by autophagy. So there's a suggestion that with higher levels, there's a, a obstruction in the flow through the autophagy uh, uh, process. And she was able to use um, a pharmacologic agent, spermidine, on the endothelial cells that enhanced uh, autophagy protein expression and was able to restore in vitro the insulin-mediated enos phosphorylation in the endothelial cells from people with diabetes. We've also really been interested in uh, novel um, diabetes therapies. So this both is looking at ER stress and also, interestingly to me, looking at uh, GLP-1, so this is uh, using liraglutide. Um, as you know, we, there's a lot of press now both about um, the impact of 
uh, GLP-1 agents for weight loss and cardiovascular benefit now. So you can see here that when she took the endothelial cells from people with diabetes and treated them with liraglutide, there was an improvement in their insulin response, um, as well as a reduction in the elevations that we saw in multiple ER stress proteins here with the phosphorylation of IRE1-alpha. And this seemed to be um, also through um, modulation of JNK phosphorylation. So what I've showed you up until this point is looking at the endothelial cells, looking at protein expression, some signaling uh, pathways, but we were also really interested in uh, looking, being able to do um, more omics approaches, both looking at uh, coding and non-coding RNA um, in the endothelial cells. And one of the challenges has been that we get a few endothelial cells and as you might imagine, a lot of white cells. So we take the endothelial cells, we lace the red cells, um, and then being able to um, sort out the endothelial cells from the white cells. And we used a number of different approaches using complex full cytometry approaches, and then um, really have now settled on using just a single magnetic bead uh, positive selection for the endothelial cells, which seems to get good, at least adequate separation and Reason and good RNA quality that we can use to assess what's going on in the endothelial cells separate from, from the white cells. So we have an ongoing project, um, again, funded through the AHA SFRN to look at coding and non-coding RNA and endothelial cells. And I'll just show you some of the preliminary work from, from this project. Um, in our, our first sets of individuals, interestingly, a lot of the pathways that we see differentially expressed in the endothelial cells from people with diabetes sort of correlate with some of our prior uh, hypothesis focused work showing changes in mitochondrial pathways and in ER stress pathways, as, other, as well as other cell stress pathways um, in the endothelial cells from people with diabetes. And then we've been able now to um, actually look at microRNA expression levels um, in the endothelial cells. So I'm showing you work here from in 20 and 20 individuals um, that we can see that they're both up and down regulated microRNA in the endothelial cells from people with diabetes. And the, um, the postdoc who's been working on this project is really focused from some of our um, work in the first set of samples on microRNA 4093P, as well as that this has been implicated in vascular responses from prior experimental studies. And so he's um, uh, shown that this uh, microRNA, if you, 4093P, that it's also upregulated in a cell culture model of high glucose, high palmitate, that he can lower it with an inhibitory microRNA. And then actually in um, in the, uh, he can restore the insulin response in these cultured endothelial cells using the inhibitor of microRNA 4093P. And he's going on to look at how this happens if this is also replicated, taking the endothelial cells from patients with diabetes and treating them with this um, inhibitor of 4093P. We've also been looking at, uh, at protein uh, levels and circulation in the uh, patients with diabetes and connecting them with our endothelial cell insulin signaling work. So this is looking at a set of O-link circulating biomarkers relevant to cardiovascular disease and selected markers correlated uh, in a cohort of individuals where we had them measured and had the insulin-mediated enos phosphorylation. And interestingly, one of the marker oxidative stress markers here, peroxinase 3, that was correlated with the insulin mediated response also correlated with the levels of microRNA 4093P. I'm going to shift from um, talking about uh, diabetes to talking about a little bit about uh, tobacco products. Um, and uh, and both PD and some of uh, our work looking at um, at cardiovascular health and novel tobacco products. So, um, as I mentioned, you we've known for decades now that um, that smoking traditional cigarettes is an accelerator for atherosclerosis, including in the limb. And uh, whether that's related to nicotine or other components, including volatile organic compounds that are produced. In from combustible cigarettes, you know, what is the driver of atherosclerosis from smoking cigarettes? And that would help us better understand when we're evaluating novel tobacco products, including vape products and electronic cigarettes, 
which while they don't produce tar and don't produce some other compounds, they do produce several volatile organic compounds and obviously high levels of, of nicotine as well. Um, so um, some epidemiology evidence that we did looking at this. So this is from a, a data set um, called the PATH data set, which is a nationally representative sample that's oversampled for patients using tobacco products. Um, and in the most recent wave, they did ask about, um, about chest pain in adults who were over 40. And we looked at their... Um, their description of their type of tobacco product that they used at the at the prior wave. So we know that at least it was a continuous use of this type of tobacco product um, over the years between the two sets of questionnaires. And you can see that the individuals who are using combustible tobacco have a higher incidence of developing chest pain. That's um, as expected compared to non-use. Um, importantly, those individuals who use com a combination of combustible cigarettes uh, with um, e-cigarettes also have a higher incidence of developing chest pain, but it seemed that those individuals who are exclusively using e-cigarettes did not have a higher rate of using, of developing chest pain, and um, and so uh, perhaps it's lower than those who are combustible cigarette users. So I think there's this is sort of building on some lines of evidence that when we, uh, if people can switch completely from combustible cigarettes to electronic cigarettes, perhaps this is a is a lower um, harm state. But if they're combined using electronic cigarettes and combustible cigarettes, that it's not. And this, unfortunately, is much more commonly what we see both in epidemiologic evidence. This group of dual users is much larger than those who are exclusive e-cigarette users. In our laboratory, we've done a lot of work focused on looking at young, healthy individuals and what happens to them, uh, those who are using electronic cigarettes and then looking at them before and after their acute use. So we have a special room in our laboratory where uh, people can come in and use their tobacco products and we do structured use of people who are different tobacco product users. And we look at um, endothelial responses and look at the endothelial cells from those individuals. So. Um, the, in terms of what happens for flow-mediated dilation response acutely um, in individuals when they use their electronic cigarette products, it's actually, there's a reduction, acute reduction in flow-mediated uh, dilation, and that's true across all the groups of individuals, those who are sole um, e-cigarette users here, these are all pod e-cigarette users, dual users, um, as and similar to the, the combustible cigarette users and all. Um, compared to the non-users who are just using uh, simulating smoking through a straw, there's no change in their flow mediated dilation. And then when we look at the isolated endothelial cells from these individuals, um, there's a uh, abnormal uh, nitric oxide production in the endothelial cells from patients who are both, when you look either at e-cigarette users or combustible cigarette users, and there's a, a lower levels of the um, uh, the uh, stimulated enos phosphorylation across both the, the dual and sole pod users, um, similar to cigarette users compared to, uh, compared to, to non-users. Um, so I've, all the work that I've shown you uh, working on the endothelial cells, you know, are, are, are samples of individuals that we've uh, recruited based on uh, their clinical status, their risk factor status. We've now uh, been funded and are actively um, enrolling individuals in the Framingham Heart Study collecting endothelial cells. So um, the individuals in the Framingham Heart Study uh, who are in the third generation, so these are the grandchildren and uh, their family members from the original Framingham Heart Study cohort are, um, are coming into the, the study and we're uh, collecting endothelial cells. We've done about 250 individuals. So we started in in November, and we're uh, planning to do RNA sequencing on a subset of the individuals, as well as looking at um, selected markers of, of organelle stress and looking at um, in this cohort of middle-aged adults how they how it relates to to cardiovascular risk factors, particularly metabolic risk factors. Bringing it back to to peripheral artery disease. Um, 
I, I just want to highlight this study that I collect was a collaborative work with uh, Vipul Chitalia, who's one of our faculty members in our nephrology department and led by Dr. Rinse, who's a vascular surgeon. And they were looking at animal models, looking at uremic metabolites, particularly tryptophan metabolites, and how they uh, impaired uh, um, high limb ischemia in a, in a kid, chronic kidney disease model of PAD and showing that there was uh, these tryptophan metabolites impaired in the angiogenesis response through um, AHR and WIND signaling. And they, we had a cohort of individuals, um, actually, that was a cohort initially uh, led by Jovita and that I've taken over, where we had looked at uh, and collected samples from these individuals and then followed them for limb events over time. And in this cohort of individuals, we were able to show that selected tryptophan metabolites also predicted adverse uh, limb events. And I think it's just a nice story to talk about on uh, ways to do research collaboratively and also to think about as you're you know, bringing together clinical work and collecting uh, samples from clinical patients, how that can really then provide important evidence to support what's happening um, in our basic researchers looking at animal models of disease. And also just highlighting the links, I, you know, we talked about diabetes and PAD, but I think a key part of the future also is thinking about chronic kidney disease and, and PAD and thinking about how we could intervene even earlier in disease um, to reduce uh, the limb consequences of CKD. I'm going to finish my slide set and hopefully leave us time to have more questions and discussion, uh, coming a little bit back to where we are in terms of therapies and uh, diabetes and PED. So there are many novel, we really live in a, a great moment in taking care of patients with vascular disease that we have many novel therapeutic approaches. I'm not going to talk about all of these antithrombotic therapy, lipid modifying therapy, and, and not to forget smoking cessation. I'm um, just going to show a little bit of the evidence from some of the, uh, the glucose lowering therapies, which I think really just highlights this issue of um, it's not just about lowering glucose, but it's how we do it. Um, so in terms of uh, looking at, I showed you some of our cell work looking at GLP-1 receptor agonists, but in terms of the clinical work, uh, looking here at liraglutide, so uh, from the clinical trials, these were overall patients um, with uh, cardiovascular risk factors and vas established vascular disease. And when they classified individuals in terms of whether or not they had polyvascular disease or just single bed, those individuals who had polyvascular disease had not only the highest rate of major adverse cardiovascular events, but the greatest derived benefit from a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And then there's some um, evidence suggesting that perhaps uh, loraglutide might be important in terms of reducing amputation risk as well. And I think we'll be interested to see now that we have the obesity cardiovascular outcome data as we start to see, um, uh, hopefully in subsequent studies related to limb events. And then if, uh, there's an ongoing study looking at a claudication treatment with, uh, with semaglutide in patients with established PAD. Um, what about SGLT2 inhibitors? So as you know, there was a lot of um, concern raised about the possibility, particularly with canagliflozin, about amputation risk. So I just wanted to show you some of the data about EMPA and cardiovascular events in the PAD subgroup. So you can see amongst the entire group, this is in the empa reg study, there is a reduction of death, major adverse cardiovascular events, and no change in amputation risk. Um, and that was similar in the subgroup with established clinical PAD. So no signal here that there was an increased amputation risk um, using SGLT2 and SGLT2 inhibitor. Another way of looking at this, um, so from, from administrative data sets, uh, looking at um, whether or not there's an increased amputation risk comparing SGLT2 to other um, diabetes uh, treatments. Um, and overall, no suggestion here that there was an increased risk of amputation overall in all patients or in PED. The only group here that sort of the point estimate, though not significant, of, uh, that's higher in SGLT2 might be compared to GLP-1 receptor agonists, but I sort of wonder whether that's maybe that there's some benefit here from GLP-1 receptor, receptor agonists. Um, so overall, how do I to do this in my practice? Uh, I am using SGLT2 inhibitors in my patients with PAD. 
I'm uh, the only patients that I have, and especially if they have um, other indications, so heart failure, for example, which is many of our patients with established PAD, the only patients that I might wait to start it in the patients who have open ulcers, I might wait until they have treatment um, and healing before starting the SGLT2 inhibitor. I just want to come back to, I talked, I put a little bit of data in the very beginning talking about, um, about the higher rate of PAD amongst uh, black Americans compared to white Americans. They've been pretty involved both in the American College of Cardiology and the AHA with a couple of scientific statements that we have uh, thinking about ways to reduce reduce health disparities in PED, and happy to discuss that more. And then more recently, we had a, a statement that just came out um, talking about how to increase the number of women in interventional vascular specialties, and this was across vascular surgery, um, interventional radiology, and, and cardiology. Um, so a topic close to, to my heart as well, even though I'm not an interventionalist, but thinking about how we can do better at increasing the number of, of women in our cardiovascular sciences and, uh, and clinical care. Um, so I'll just finish with um, saying that I've shown you some data talking about how endothelial dysfunction and vascular dysfunction predicts cardiovascular events, showed you about endothelial dysfunction in PED and in diabetes, and then our work looking at endothelial cell phenotype and how it's altered in diabetes, changing insulin signaling and nitric oxide. One possible set of changes that seems to be present is the increase in organelle stress and that it's reversible with novel medicines for diabetes that have been shown to have cardiovascular benefit. That tobacco products certainly contribute to endothelial dysfunction and that includes clear. novel tobacco products like e-cigarettes and that we're really entering a new era in how we think about um, the combined treatment of PAD and diabetes. I'd like to thank many, many people across um, who have been involved in, in generating the work. This is my um, current laboratory group on a retreat at my, uh, my place in Vermont, so a little bit colder and snowier than where you are in Houston, um, as well as our, you know, my group from the, from the AHA uh, CB, CBDM program, the investigators in CKD, and the Framingham Vascular Group, and our ongoing work that's co-led by Jen Ho and myself to collect endothelial cells in, in the Framingham participants. So with that, I'm going to maybe stop sharing my slides. So yeah, that would be great. Other. Thank you so much, I'm Dr. Hamburg. Discussion. Thank you for those insights into um, diabetes and also tobacco-induced vascular disease. Um, I, I wonder if you could um, talk to us a little bit about the differences between um, non-diabetic vascular disease and diabetic vascular disease. Maybe tell us a little bit about how those patients are different in the way they present, the differences in the disease uh, of the vessels, and maybe mechanisms that might be responsible for those differences. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll start with talking about how PAD may be different from atherosclerosis and other beds, and then maybe come to then 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 come to your question specifically about diabetes. So. You know, it, it, there's part of it where we've talked about um, athro being a coronary disease and being a disease in the periphery as well. But now that we see so much evidence that patients who have polyvascular disease do the worst amongst all patients, you know, certainly patients who have combined PAD and CAD do worse than the patients with, um, with coronary disease alone. I've thought a lot about, is it really all the same or is it different? And one of the key drivers there, I think, is how much more of a burden is the disease that we're seeing for PED from diabetes and, and also from CKD. So I think that's sort of a, a roundabout way to, to, to get to your question and that, and that these are the patients that I see clinically back in my office over and over again. So I can have the patients with, with coronary disease who had you know, their MI 10 years ago, and I check in with them once a year, and not much happens. But my patients with combined PAD and CAD, I feel like if I don't see them every six months, there's something happening. They're getting, they're getting worse, they're having recurrent events. So what are the drivers there? You know, is it, 
and I don't think it's just um, simply that we can explain that with the glucose alone, because we've had a number of studies now that have been just looking at this question of can we control glucose better um, in patients with coronary disease or PAD, and they don't, they don't, that in and of itself, just getting a lower hemoglobin A1C level doesn't seem to do the trick. So now that we have newer therapies that do reduce uh, cardiovascular events amongst patients with diabetes, I think it's really an opportunity to understand better what are the, the mechanisms here. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we could do better in terms of the, the animal, you know, how can we can get better at our basic models to think about this, this process. Then we talked about also, I think patients with diabetes um, have more of this combination of microvascular disease and macrovascular disease. So they have, you know, femoral artery athero or, or uh, LAD athero, but they also have um, microvascular disease that is important for driving their kidney disease, their eye disease, but also I think important in terms of driving heart disease, um, in terms of what's happening that the small vessel disease, Josh Beshman has done this nice work, that small vessel disease, microvascular disease combined with PAD, these patients have risk fact, a 30-fold increased risk of going on to amputation. And now we have some evidence that it may be involved in what's happening in terms of their risk rates of, um, of heart failure as well. So the combination of both microvascular and macrovascular disease in patients with diabetes, I think, is critical. Thank you, Dr. Hamburger, for your, um, uh, your insight in a lot of aspects of uh, PAD or diabetes. Uh, so my question is actually following the previous question. So uh, what do you think is the best animal model to mimic PAD? Because I got this question all the time criticize uh, the, the model that we're using all the time, so. Yeah, so I always say I, I do cell work, I do people, but I, I don't do any um, rodents. So, you know, happy to think about your thoughts about this as well, but I'll say that I do think it's a challenge that the model that we've been using is largely an acute ischemia model, which, you know, we see, certainly we see patients with acute ischemia or acute on chronic ischemia as part of the clinical expression of PAD, but we see so many patients who have chronic ischemia um, due to atherosclerotic obstruction. And I, I do think that the, and we don't have good therapies for that, right? We still, I, I talked about the increased uh, number of therapies for PAD, but those are largely in terms of both reducing major adverse limb events and reducing major adverse cardiovascular events but I still don't have anything to offer to my patients beyond supervised exercise and celostazole to help them with, with their claudication symptoms. So I, I, and I think a key bottleneck there is that we don't have animal models for, that are good for knowing how to treat claudication, unless you think there's something coming and that if we could have that better, I, I, I think that would really open up the therapeutic um, pipeline for patients with PAD. Thank you for the um, uh, information. So my next question is that I'm very inc interested in the way that you collect the patient and the cellular cells. So I'm wondering, have you uh, looked at the cell uh, cellular composition of the cells you collected? Since I know you're most interested in EC, but uh, you can also collect some other cell type, right? So have you tried to identify what cell type have you collected and uh, even you um, uh, kind of uh, measure if there is a um, conversation between different cell type under different disease condition? Yeah, so um, a couple ways of thinking about that um, in terms of what kinds of cells that we get. Um, I mean, certainly we've looked at you know, when we're working on validating that we're getting endothelial cells, we have looked at, you know, what are the cells that we're selecting um, or not selecting using either flow cytometry or a bead selection, sort of showing that um, in the cells that we do collect, we're not seeing white cell markers and we are seeing endothelial cell markers and obviously in the converse in the, in the set of white cells that we're seeing. 
Um, but perhaps you're asking about heterogeneity amongst the endothelial cells. And we've done a little bit, I didn't show, we've done a little bit of um, about single cell RNA-seq work um, uh, looking at these endothelial cells. I think there's a lot more to go in that. You know, I, I it's interesting because I think that people have done obviously a lot of a plaque characterization and single cell work, and I feel like they've mostly been seeing changes in what happens in the smooth muscle cell phenotype, um, and less about what's happening in the endothelial cell phenotype um, or populations. But I still think it's possible, and would love to be able to do that, say in arterial endothelial cells or in our, in our, especially in arterial endothelial cells from areas where there's known athro. You know, are there changes um, that we could detect? At, and the different populations of endothelial cells. We do see different populations of endothelial cells, you know, a few different populations of endothelial cells um, from the, you know, we've probably done about five um, single cell RNA-seq. Yeah, thank you so much. But maybe you were talking about other cells. We don't yeah. really see, you know, we're, we're doing veins here. We're not getting like deep enough to say see smooth muscle cells, um, a harder challenge, I think, you know, when we think about other processes and how we could get smooth muscle cells in a recurrent way from people, I think that's harder. Before we conclude the program, uh, Dr. Hamburg, I thought you might uh, tell us what you think are the most exciting uh, new therapies or developments um, on the horizon for peripheral arterial disease or for diabetic vascular disease. What's getting you excited these days about the, the area? Yeah, great um, thought. I think um, for, for, for PAD overall, I, I, I'm very excited that we, you know, that patients with PAD are being included in trials of uh, when we think about diabetes therapies, when we think about therapies directed for heart disease that we're measuring whether or not people have PED and, and looking at limb events. So really excited about um, trying to increase the amount that we're getting to patients of novel antithrombotic therapies, which I didn't talk much about, but a lot of evidence there as well, and thinking about getting um, new uh, diabetes lowering therapies to patients. But at the same time, I think we have a lot of ways to go in terms of, as I suggested, therapies that improve um, walking ability, excited to see whether or not some of these diabetes medicines like GLP-1 improve walking ability in patients with PAD. And then really um, about, uh, you know, I, I mentioned about health equity, thinking about how we can do a better job delivering the therapies that we know work to more people. Well, thank you, Dr. Hamburg. We're looking forward to seeing more great insights from your group. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. Uh, you've been listening to Dr. Hamburg, who's one of the leaders in uh, diabetic vascular disease, uh, one of the pioneers in that area. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Hamburg, for joining us today at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. Thank you so much for having me.